paintings ripped from their frames and stolen off the wall. A motion detector with no footage. And these two goons. <sighs> Poor guys. A getaway car with two men inside. And found at the crime scene? A fake police badge? What do all these things have in common? Hey everyone, I'm Sylvie and welcome to The Vault. Today we're looking at the greatest art heist in history. $500 million worth of art was stolen from the Isabella Stewart Gardening Museum in Boston. The 13 stolen works have never been recovered. In the 30 years since, the FBI, private investigators, journalists, they've all come up with potential leads, almost all of which tie back to organized crime. It's not because all these godfathers are art appreciators. It's more likely that they used the stolen works of art as a bargaining chip in a Boston gang war. And the art was carried out of the museum by cops. Well, cops. It was a foggy night, and St. Patrick's Day revelers were on their way home from the bars. The scene of the crime, the Isabella Stewart Gardening Museum, an ornate four-story home modeled on a Venetian palace. There are two guards on duty. There's Rick Abbott, who is 23 and plays in a band that sounds like a poor man's fish. And this is the other guard on duty, Randy. This is Randy's first night shift. He brought along his trombone, anticipating a lot of downtime so he can practice. At 12.20 a.m., our boy Rick sees a hatchback cruise by on his CCTV and shrugs it off. An hour later, the museum's side door buzzer begins to ring. It looks like a couple of cops, and it seems like they want in. Hmm. But Rick knows it's against protocol to let anyone in past 11.30 p.m. Then again, the officers say they are responding to a disturbance. Then again, what disturbance? Rick, after all, has been at the museum all night. Then again, Rick knows how crazy Bostonians can get on St. Patrick's Day. Maybe someone had climbed the fence or something. He buzzes them in. Oh, Rick, this is only the first of many lapses in judgment you're gonna have tonight, buddy. You look familiar. I think there's a general warrant out for your arrest. We're gonna need you to step away from the desk. Rick is pretty sure that there aren't any warrants out for his arrest. Also, that cop is definitely wearing a fake mustache. Okay, focus. Maybe his record wasn't clean. Maybe they knew he came to work stoned sometimes. Or maybe this was related to that time he threw a party in the museum's Dutch room. Maybe they do have something on him. Rick doesn't want to get arrested for non-compliance. He complies. Mistake number two, Rick. Mistake number two. You've done it again, Rick. Another unforced error. But this one is critical. When Rick steps away from that desk, he's stepping away from his only connection to the outside world. The museum's sole panic button. <laughs> At this point, Rick has a realization. The cops haven't read him his rights or patted him down. He can see Randy getting handcuffed out of the corner of his eye. <laughs> and Rick realizes that this is, in fact, a robbery. Gentlemen, this is, in fact, a robbery. The robbers run through the standard bad guy threats. Everyone stay cool and no one gets hurt. Tell anybody and we'll kill you, that kind of thing. Basically the robber version of Miranda writes. Rick plays it cool and says, Don't worry, they don't pay me enough to get hurt. The robbers lead Rick and Randy to the basement, where they tape him up. Each guy really gets quite the elaborate treatment. Now that the guards are subdued and no alarms have gone off, it's open season in the museum. We know from motion detector logs that the entire endeavor took 81 minutes. Kind of a leisurely pace for a robbery. At 1.51 a.m., the second floor motion detector types a message. Someone is in the Dutch room. Investigate immediately. The thieves approach their first target, a Rembrandt. The canvas is over five feet high and more than four feet wide. 
So yeah, it's pretty big. When they get real close, an alarm begins to sound, which one of the thieves artfully disables. <laughs> Meanwhile, the other thief makes moves to the short gallery. The works in the short gallery were all relatively small and easy to handle. The thief effortlessly lifts five drawings from the French artist Edgar Degas and a brass eagle from the top of a Napoleonic flagpole, which is a relatively worthless piece. An odd choice considering that there's a Michelangelo staring them right in the face. Back in the Dutch room, one of our thieves is struggling to remove the Rembrandts from their heavy frames. So they take the amateur route and hack away at the canvas, removing it from its wooden backing. Truly a tragedy. The painting they're brutalizing is Rembrandt's only known seascape, Christ in the storm on the Sea of Galilee. They do the same to another Rembrandt, called A Lady and Gentleman in Black, and then they do it again to a Vermeer called The Concert, probably the most valuable piece they lifted, with an estimated worth of $250 million. The concert is displayed back to back with a much less valuable painting, a painting by Govert Flink, titled Landscape with Obelisk. They grab that one too. Oh, and last but not least, an ancient Chinese bronze goo, worth a couple grand. And they never even made it to the third floor, which was stacked with masterpieces. Ay, 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 these robbers. At some point in their heist, the thieves stopped by the blue room on the first floor and lift an oil painting from French artist Edouard Manet. Once again, they take the B-side Manet, which is hanging right next to a more valuable portrait of his mother. When the deed is finally done, the two thieves make their way out the way they came in, through the side door of the Isabella Gardner Museum and out into the night, where they and the priceless works vanish. Okay, so you might be thinking to yourself, how did these two guys get in and out of the museum undetected, stealing almost half a billion dollars worth of art? Where are the dang security cameras? And it's a pretty good question. And the answer lies somewhat in the will and testament of Isabella Stewart Gardner herself. Isabella Stewart Gardner was an eccentric bohemian millionaire, born in 1840, and she got her kicks by scandalizing the Boston elite. Her moves included walking her pet lion Rex down the street on a leather leash, greeting her dinner guests from up in a tree, and showing up to the symphony in provocative headgear. The museum was another one of her bold ideas. She and her husband had always wanted to design their own museum, and in it, they would put all of the art that they collected on their travels. But then he died of a sudden stroke in 1898, and just six weeks after his death, she bought land, hired an architect, and started designing the museum of their dreams. According to the Washington Post, she took on sort of an unconventional approach to project management. She'd wander through the construction site with a trumpeter at her side. She'd have him play one note to summon the plumber and another for the architect. Isabella was a bit of a stickler when it came to her museum. She hounded the architects and engineers to make sure everything was exactly as she envisioned it to be. She even moved into the private living quarters on the museum's fourth floor and spent an entire year curating the galleries. She stayed intimately involved in the museum, rearranging and arranging the galleries until her death in 1924. In her will, Isabella wrote that no changes could be made to the museum, no rearranging of arts, and no renovations of the building. And this is why the museum was so easily plundered. The lack of proper security cameras made the heist a virtually effortless affair, even though the head of security had been begging the board of trustees to update the security system for years. The current operators of the museum hold out hope that the paintings will one day be returned in the future. And honoring Isabella's wishes, the empty frames still hang in the very same spot 28 years later. There are a lot of theories about who may have been behind the heist and where the paintings ended up. Theories that include mafia bosses, petty criminals, the Irish Republican army, and remember our boy Rick? Well, yeah, he's in there too. At first, the FBI thought it was the work of notorious Boston-based art thief, Miles Connor Jr. In 1974, Connor stole five Wyeth paintings from an estate in Maine. He also masterminded the theft and return of Rembrandt's Girl with a Fur-Trimmed Cloak from Boston's Museum of Fine Art, all part of his plan to get a reduced sentence for the Wyeth theft. He had also pulled off past jobs while dressed as a police officer. He seemed like such a natural fit that investigators believe he may have been involved in the Gardner heist, 
even though he was in prison at the time. Connor said, You'd have known if it was me. I would have taken the Titian. I mean, he's not wrong. Rape of Europa was the most valuable painting in Boston. Another writer called it the grandest painting in America. Yet, the Gardner thieves didn't touch it. This leads us to believe that the perpetrators of the Gardner heist were in fact mobsters and not art aficionados. So many leads in this case point to Boston mob figures, in part because at the time of the heist, a lot of the gangsters had a fun little legal trick up their sleeves. They believed that if you were facing a long sentence due to a white collar federal crime, that you could bargain your way to a reduced sentence by helping broker the return of a stolen masterpiece. The Gardner Museum made this laughably easy. It was a treasure trove. It was well known amongst Boston criminals that the art was basically unprotected. The FBI even warned the museum that they were at a high risk for a heist. By the 1980s, different guys from different organized crime rings had all cased the joint. So, which of them could it have been? Here are some of the most prominent Boston mobsters suspected of the heist. There's Whitey Bulger, the notorious Irish-American mob boss. One theory from a former Scotland Yard detective who worked as a PI on the case is that Bulger was the mastermind. The freelance art detective, Charles Hill, has pretty solid heist-solving credentials. In 1996, he led the recovery of The Scream, and in 1993, he recovered a Vermeer and a Goya that had been stolen by a Dublin gangster. Here's how Hill connects the dots. In the 1980s, Whitey Bulger was at peak mob bossery, which included arms dealing. This was also at the height of the Troubles, the armed conflict in Northern Ireland. Bulger was shipping weapons across the Atlantic to the IRA. In 1984, one of his shipments was seized by the Irish Navy. Hill thinks that Bulger sent the stolen paintings to the IRA as a consolation prize for the intercepted weapons, and that the paintings are somewhere in the Republic of Ireland to this day. There's no evidence to support this, and both the museum's security director and the FBI dismiss these theories. Then there's the Italians. The stolen art may have been taken in a fun, capery side plot of what was a decades-long power struggle for control of Boston's underworld. The main players were Cadillac Frank Salemi versus his rival, Vincent the Animal Ferreira. Over the course of these conflicts, dozens of murders and assassination attempts occurred. New England papers covered it extensively. FBI investigators think that the paintings were stolen by a group of guys who worked for Cadillac Frank Salemi and then were sold on the black market. But who were these guys? Over the years, they've managed to stay mostly anonymous, other than some key appearances in press coverage. Robert Garente, a Salemi loyalist, was in charge of hiding the loot. David A. Turner was the mastermind who orchestrated the theft, according to the FBI. Robert Gentile was the fence. That's the guy responsible for selling the stolen works. The FBI maintains Gentile knows something that could help them, and that the paintings ended up in Philly via Gentile's connections to the Cosa Nostra there. The feds raided Gentile's home in 2012. They busted out ground-penetrating radar and found a false floor in his garden shed. But the compartment underneath was empty. Cue sad trombone. In Gentile's basement, they found police uniforms, badges, handcuffs, tasers, and two-way radios. Also in the basement was a Boston Herald article about the stolen art published the day after the heist. There was a handwritten note tucked into the newspaper. It was a list of each of the stolen works next to their potential black market value, totaling almost $8 million, so much less than what they're actually worth. Things are looking pretty bad for Gentile, right? But not so fast. In 2015, Pulitzer winning journalist Stephen Kirkjan published his extensively reported and sourced book on the case. His reporting contradicts the FBI's official theory on the Gardner heist, even though it does feature some of the same characters. But Kirkjan's book follows leads and gives details that the FBI never did. Here's how Kirkjan's theory deviates from the FBI's. Remember David Turner, the supposed mastermind? Kirkjan's reporting puts him in Florida on a cocaine trafficking run at the time of the heist. And his fingerprints weren't a match with those from the crime scene. Kirk Jan thinks the paintings may have been stolen by Vinnie Ferreira's boys. In 2014, Kirk Jan got a tip from an anonymous caller. The caller said he was an intermediary for Vincent Ferreira. The caller said, Bobby Donati robbed the gardener to get Vinnie Ferreira out of jail. And suggested Donati could have buried the work at his place. So who was Donati? He was Ferreira's confidant and driver. And he may have been one of those two cops who robbed the gardener. 
Not only did he have an art thieving history with Miles Connor, but more importantly, he was close friends with Bobby Garente, who you'll recall was affiliated with Cadillac Frank's gang. Weird, right? Fraternizing with the enemy. Hmm. Kirk Jan thinks that as the heat got turned up on the investigation of the missing art, and as the war between Ferreira and Salemi got bloodier, Donati knew he was a marked man. He may have buried some of the art in his or his mom's backyard and handed off others to his best frenemy, Bobby Garente, for safekeeping, hoping it might take some of the heat off from the FBI. But we can't ask Donati about it because he was brutally bludgeoned and stabbed to death on his front porch in 1991. After Donati's death, Garente may have stashed some of the paintings in his farmhouse in Maine. And when Garente got a cancer diagnosis in the early aughts, he passed the works off to Gentile for safekeeping. But get this, Gentile might possibly have had them in the secret compartment in his shed after all. One of Gentile's adult kids later told Kirk Jan that the backyard had flooded and that their dad had been really broken up about whatever he'd lost in there. But the dude steadfastly maintains his innocence. So here's something Kirk Jan wonders. Is it possible that Gentile really did have the paintings, but that they were destroyed when his basement flooded? And so he maintains his innocence because of the sheer embarrassment of messing up such a beautiful score and putting himself at risk of other gangs. Oh, and Rick? Do you think we'd forgotten about Rick? No, we didn't forget about Rick. For a hot minute in the 2010s, there were theories that the heist had a man on the inside, and all signs pointed to Rick. But the FBI disputes his involvement, so we aren't going to implicate our boy Rick here. If you want, you can read about it online. Despite all these leads, the FBI has yet to recover the stolen goods. To this day, nobody has confirmed the sighting of any of the 13 stolen works. The Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum is offering $10 million to anybody who can return the paintings in good condition or offer any information that could lead to their whereabouts. So keep your eyes peeled if you're ever creeping around your grandma's attic. If you happen to stumble across a Rembrandt up there, you may end up not only a hero, but a very wealthy hero. And Isabella would thank you. If you loved learning about the Gardner heist, you can check out Stephen Kirkjan's book, or art thief Miles Connor has written a bunch about his exploits. Or there's tons of resources online, your pick. If you liked this video, hit the bell icon below and that way you're notified for whenever we put out a new video. And if you have a favorite robbery, scheme, scam, whatever, let us know in the comments. Thank you again and we'll see you next time.